Hey, thanks so much for checking out today's message at Propel Church. We believe that God is moving powerfully in our church and we would love to connect with you. So be sure to hit the like button, comment, subscribe, even share. If you want to get connected, you can visit our website, propel.church. But for now, let's lean in, take notes and enjoy God's word. Man, it is uh, so good to be with you this morning. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Nick Newman. I'm the lead pastor here at Propel, and, and we're so honored that you chose to be with us because you could have been anywhere, but you picked Propel Church, and so we're excited that you're uh, here today. If you are new with us, we would love for you to do one thing for us. As you leave today, be sure to stop by the new here tent on your way out. We've got a gift that we'd love to put in your hands, and in that gift, you're going to find out more information about the church, but you're also going to see a card on there that has a three-week challenge on it. We'd say give us three weeks because we think trying us once is not going to give you the full picture. But if at the end of three weeks you don't feel like this is the right fit for you, there are other churches that we recommend because we want you to be plugged into a church somewhere. And uh, church, can you help me welcome everybody that's new here to Propel Church? Come on. So excited. And if you are kind of new around Propel and you're looking to call this church home the next step for you is what we call Discover. That's taking place next week during the 1030 worship experience. So uh, what you'll do is you can RSVP by going to propel.church slash events or stopping by Next Steps. But Discover is where you learn more about Propel. You figure out how God uniquely wired and designed you. You discover your, your purpose. And then if you want, you have the opportunity to make a team. Uh, sorry, make the decision to get on a team. And uh, you don't make a team that early in the process, right? That'd be crazy. And so, uh, but you can sign up for Discover. We cook for these events. We've got a whole cook team here at Propel Church. And uh, Propel Kids is extended through Discover. So we've got your kids taken care of. We've got food covered. Let us know you're coming next week. It would be awesome. Uh, we are in week two of a message series called It Is Well. Turn to somebody and say, It Is Well. You did better than 9 a.m. Come on. So uh, we're in this series, and last week we talked about how it is well in our relationship with the Lord because Jesus is the anchor of our soul. We talked about how in, in, in a boat, a boat has an anchor, and the purpose of an anchor is to, to seat the boat whenever it goes through hardships or storms. And Hebrews taught us that Jesus is our hope. He is the anchor of our soul that's going to give you and I the ability to kind of navigate and waver or not waver when we go through storms. And this week, I want to give you a message titled uh, Marriage on the Rock. Not Marriage on the Rocks. That's a different, that's a different title. No, it's Marriage on the Rock. The rock, because uh, you and I need to talk about marriage as we look at God's plan and God's design for it. Because I want you to be able to say, it is well with my marriage. Now, for some of you in the room, uh, some of you are single and you're like, Pastor, this is not going to apply to me at all. Here's what I want to let you know. The majority of the problems you have in marriage start with stuff you did before you were married, Okay. Because marriage is two imperfect people coming together. And when you get two imperfect people that come together, they don't make a perfect person, right? They bring all of their issues together. And so this message is very applicable for you who are single in the room. I'm not going to make you raise your hand, right? Because some, there's some dudes in here, they be scouting, right? So <laughs> that's a different day, right? But no, if, you're, if you are single, this message is going to be very applicable to your life to learn what God's desire for marriage is is. Maybe you're dating in the room and, and, and you go, well, I don't really know if we're going to get married. Listen, dating without the intention of marriage is called wasting time. And so if you are here today and you're just dating, this is going to give you a blueprint for what God wants in marriage. If you got a fiance, this is going to help you. And uh, maybe if you're here and your marriage is struggling today, I believe God's going to shift some things in your life. And so if you have a Bible, let's go to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. If you don't, it's going to be available on the screen beside me. And if you don't have a, a physical Bible, we would love to put one in your hands. As you leave today, stop by Next Steps. We'll give you one free of charge because we want to make sure you have access to God's Word. Matthew chapter 7. This is what the text says. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it 
is wise. Now, this is Jesus talking. Jesus says, anyone who listens to my teaching. So Jesus says, if you listen to it, you're wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in, torrents and floodwaters rise, and and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is like a foolish person who builds house on sand. When the rain comes and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And so Jesus tells this, this story of, of two home builders, right? He factors in no interest rates at the time because, come on, some of y'all are in that situation. You're trying to build, it's crazy. But, but when you go to build a house, it's important that you assess what foundation you're going to build it on. And so Jesus says there's two different types of foundation that we build on. One is built on the rock, and those are people who do what Jesus instructs them to do. Those people are built on a solid foundation. The other people are built on sand, and they they don't listen to what Jesus says. And what happens is when storms come in, even though on the outside you may never see the foundation, the foundation of your marriage is actually revealed in the storm. The foundation of your marriage isn't revealed when every thing is going well because anybody can win together but how do you respond when chaos begins to happen that's when the foundation of your marriage is truly revealed the proof of your marriage isn't found when you're succeeding but how you handle life when storms are brewing and a lot of times we we want to come in and hear a message about how like storms can just not happen in our lives anymore. But that's not what Scripture teaches us. Jesus would say in multiple times that you and I will face troubles of many kinds in this world. But if you build your life on the right foundation, what Jesus is telling them in Matthew 7 is building on the right foundation enables you and I to weather the storm. If you want to be able to say it is well in your marriage, your marriage is going to have to be built on the rock, not sand. So the question is, is your marriage built on the rock? And most people would say, yeah. But on the outside, a lot of people look like they've got their house built on the right foundation. Until a storm happens. The next thing you know, all your siding is gone, right? The roof ripped off. It feels like everything's collapsing. And today, what we're going to do as we unpack God's Word, I'm going to give you three things that are foundational if you want to build your marriage on the rock. Here's the first one, is that the foundation is built on God's Word. The foundation is built on God's Word. If you want to understand the design of something, you've got to consult the designer. Marriage is not man's idea. It's God's idea. It's not only God's idea, it's God's institution. And so to find God's blueprint for marriage, we go back to the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis chapter 2 where we find out what God designed marriage to be like and to look like. And so if you go to Genesis chapter 2, you're going to find that God has been creating all of these things. And he's been saying after the days that he creates that it's good. But then it says that the Lord God said that it's not good. Well, what's not good for you to leave your husband by himself at the house? Right? No, no. It says for... (laughs) Some of y'all know that's true. You're like, I can't leave him there by himself. No, it says it's not good for man to be alone, so I will make a helper who is just right for him. So so in God's design for marriage, it is two people coming together. One of them is designed to be a helper. Now, when some people read this passage of text, we look at helper as if it is a lesser than individual, like it's a subservient person. That is not what God is communicating here. If you go back to the original language, the way he defines helper is is not a lesser person. The, The words that are used there communicate that they're the same, but they're different. 
And one of the ways that they're different is in verse 19 and even in verse 20, God gives Adam the instruction to go name all the animals, to, to kind of begin to rule and domain over the world. Eve is different from the rest of, of the animals in the other creation because she comes from Adam. She's taken from his rib and she is just right for him. The same but different. Woman is not a, a duplicate but a complement that completes human creation. It doesn't mean that she is less than, but it reveals that he cannot do life by himself. He needs help. And in some marriages, even in Christian marriages, we treat wives as if they're less than husbands. And that is not God's design. God's design is that she would be different, that she would be essentially personal and human-like, that she is just like him and yet the exact opposite of him at the same time. She is a counterpart that is helpful for him. You keep reading in verse 22 and it says, Then the Lord God made woman from the rib and he brought the, her to the man. At last the woman exclaimed, or the man exclaimed, This is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman. Some people believe that Adam saw her and went, Whoa! And that's how you get woman. Whoa, man. Well, you know, all right, keep going. That's a cool little dad joke there. All right. Because she was taken from man. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So marriage shows us, God's design shows us a couple of things. One, that, that, that marriage is designed to have a help mate, but not it to be a subservient. The second thing it shows us is that God designed marriage to be between man and woman. And as we look at Scripture, again, we are talking about God's design. If I came to you and said, here are all the latest features of the iPad, here's how it's designed, you're not going to get mad at me for the design. So you can get mad at how God defines marriage, but marriage is designed by God to be between a man and a woman. And we can't just say, because God doesn't say like, oh, you know, it can't be between a man or a man and a woman and a woman that, that, that you know, we can kind of throw that in. Because if we look at the totality of all of Scripture, it confirms God's design to be between man and woman. We go into another thing. Another thing we see in Genesis 2 is that there are two individuals becoming one. The text says this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. Probably 60% of your marriage problems stem from the fact that you have one individual, whether husband or wife, that will not leave their other family and cling to their spouse. What marriage shows us by God's design is that you are not joining families in marriage. You are starting a new family in marriage. I know some in-laws might get mad at me after this. You can send an email to apicket at propel.church. Because the number one problem, truthfully, in pastoring, the number one problem that I see in marriages are people unwilling to leave their parents and cling to their spouse. This is God's design. And so when you get married and you start your new family, it's not that you're rude or you're, 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 you're harsh towards your parents. You should honor them. But the filter is no longer, what's, what, 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 this is what mom wants or this is what dad wants. No, what is best for your family? Some of you get so much anxiety when you get close to Christmas time because you feel responsible to be at every event because you've not left your family and done what's best for yours. You got to start a new family. I know I'm setting some of y'all free right now. Come on. <laughs> so, two become one. This is God's design. Third thing it shows us. Fourth thing, I'm sorry, is that sex was designed by God to be enjoyed in marriage. I know this is countercultural. Our culture teaches us that we ought to test drive a vehicle, but people are not cars. Cars don't care when you test drive them. Cars don't get attached. Cars don't get hurt and they don't feel used. Cars are meant to be bought, sold, and traded. People are not. People are not designed to be test driven before 
marriage. Sex is designed by God to be enjoyed within the confines of marriage. And to go a step further, sex is designed to be between a husband and a spouse, not a solo act. Sex is not designed to be something you plug into a wall or enjoy by yourself through a screen. Sex is designed to be intimate between husband and wife. This is God's design. And you will always drift from God's destination when you live outside of his design. You will drift outside of God's destination when you live outside of his design. You can go to that next point. And so as we were thinking through this, I was thinking about airplanes and I fly quite a bit and I wanted to see what would happen if a pilot was one degree off and so um, what I read online was for every one degree a pilot is off for every mile he travels he will be 90 feet off of his destination and that doesn't seem like a lot so I had to do math this week which I don't enjoy but I did it come on and uh And so I said, okay, well, how far off would a pilot be if he flew one degree off from Charlotte to Atlanta? And if a pilot flies one degree off from Charlotte to Atlanta, he will end up four miles away from the Atlanta airport. Most of us would think one degree of error would not be that bad in our marriage. But the problem is one degree over a long period of time will take you to a destination you never intended. And when you live outside of God's designs, your deliverables are things that he never desired for you. When you treat your wife as inferior, you've drifted from God's design, and chaos will ensue in your marriage. When marriage becomes a free-for-all, perversion is the only result. When you don't cling to your spouse, in-laws become outlaws. Come on, some some of y'all need the amen there, right? But just... (laughs) Don't, because they're here with you, okay? (laughs) When you have sex outside of marriage, the the end result is guilt and shame. And God can redeem and restore all of those things, but it's important for us to understand God's design so that we can receive his desired result. The second thing is this. The foundation is built on God's ways. The foundation is built on God's word, and the foundation is built on God's ways. And as we build it on God's ways, we go right back into Scripture, Ephesians chapter 5, 21 through 25 is a popular verse that you read at weddings. And this is what it says. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of his wife as as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. And as the church submits to Christ, so wives, you should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave his life up for her. And we keep building upon God's word. We keep adding in scripture because it's in God's word that we learn God's ways. And as we look at God's way of doing things, what it shows us is that a God-honoring marriage involves mutual submission. A God-honoring marriage is not one where you have a domineering spouse fussing at a wife consistently to submit. That is not what the text shows us. Verse 21 said, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ, which means our willingness to submit to one another is not based on the actions of each other. Our willingness to submit to one another is not, well, you know, I'd submit to him if he just took the trash out when I told him. Well, I'd submit to her if she just talked to me different. Oh, I'd submit to him if he picked up his clothes and if he didn't leave crusty towels in the bath. You know, I'd submit to her if she just let me hang out with my friends more and she let me do what, no, no, no. That's not what submission is about. And when you, when you and I make submission contingent, struggle is inevitable. The text says that we submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. And as you and I navigate marriage, maybe the reason why we struggle submitting to our spouse is because we haven't fully submitted things to the Lord either. You and I are called to be mutually submissive to one another. And what mutual submission looks like is really what it looks like to be a good teammate. Now, this might shock you, but uh, pastors have issues too. And so if I, you know, Tori and I, we've been married for 10 years now, and and, uh, we've, you know, come on, 10 years, yeah, it's been great. 
And, uh, but, you know, as we do this, like, there are times where we fight. And when we fight, one of the first things that we say is, we're on the same team. This is what mutual submission looks like. Mutual submission looks like teamwork. It looks like working together to get through hardships. You and I are not going to be perfect in marriage, but we are called to submit to one another. And then wives, he, he takes it a step further and he says, submit to your husband as to the Lord. Now, I want to make a, a quick disclaimer because for no reason am I saying that you are called to submit to an individual that is abusing you at any, at any point. Physical, mental, spiritual, psychological. When abuse is on the table, th- this, this, this passage of Scripture is not to be used to keep you in a marriage where abuse is going on. That is not the case at all. No, when, when, when we talk about this, uh, of not submitting to a husband, in Genesis chapter 3, one of the curses of the fall is that women will have a desire to rule over their husband. That is a byproduct of Genesis 3. You can go back and read it. And so often we have women who are, who are in the position where they're going, God, bless my marriage while still living under a curse. So the text says to, to submit to your husband in everything. And there's probably going to be some things that you're like, well, I really don't want to do that. That's when submission is really a thing. Submission is not agreement. It's choosing to do what God leads us to do even when we don't feel like it. But husbands, please hear me. You are not off the hook. So if you've been elbowing your spouse like, you know what, she's called to submit, you know, that's cool. Listen, you're called to die. <laughs> that's the text. She's called to submit, you're called to die. You are called to die just like Christ died for the church. Was it the best thing for Jesus to die? No. Did he want to die? No. In fact, that's what we find in the garden, is that Jesus is going, hey, Lord, if there's any other way, this is a good time for you to tag it in. You know, like, help me out. I don't want to do this. But it was the best thing for the church. And that's the picture of what God wants you and I as husbands to understand about marriage. Is she called to submit? Yes, but you are called to die for for your spouse, just like Christ would die for the church. And too often we want our wives to submit to our own selfish agenda, but a godly husband will crucify selfish ambition so that he can love his wife. A godly husband will kill off sin that gets in the way of intimacy and connection with his spouse. A godly husband will put to death childish things to embrace his role as a spiritual leader in his home. And a godly husband will even skip a day on the lake if it means that's what's best for his family. Yeah, but she got to go out with her friends and she did this. Marriage is not about equality. It is about submission and sacrifice. Because it's in marriage as you and I submit to one another that we become holy. And I know this is countercultural because we live in a world that says, take care of you and you make sure you're covered. No one else is going to look out for you. And that's why divorce rates are so high is because people have gone into self-preservation mode and only look out for themselves, and that is not godly. If you want God's will, you've got to do it God's way. So we look at God's word, and we look at God's design, and then the third thing. Are you still with me this morning? Come on, the foundation is built on God's wisdom. The foundation is built on God's wisdom. Where do we find God's wisdom? It's in two places. We find it in his word, and we find it through his people. And what I've seen over the years of pastoring and, and being married is that if you want your marriage to thrive and be built on a solid foundation, church needs to become a non-negotiable in your life. And here's what I know. Every time I talk about church being a non-negotiable, people, people you know, oh, you're legalistic, and you, you just, we have to go to church all the time. Listen. It's really interesting that when a pastor tells you that you need to make church a priority and be there, he's legalistic. But when your kid's t-ball coach tells you you got to be at practice, you don't argue at all. It's a priority difference. If you want your marriage to thrive, you're going to have to do it God's way. And Scripture is very clear that we are not called to forsake the assembly and gather with other believers. 
A lot of times in marriage, when it comes to church, we use church as if it's a band-aid to fix the problems we've got. So when, we, when we're doing well, we don't attend. But whenever we get into struggles, we jump into church and we hope that, that one hour a week is going to fix the mess that we're in. We treat church like it's an auto body shop. This is not an auto body shop. This is the gas station. This is where you refill. The frequency is different. You thought you could just roll up here on Sunday and everything in your marriage is going to be fixed by Monday? It don't work like that. But you can get snacks, you know, like <laughs> you can refill. You can let the tank get a little, little more full. You can learn some stuff. And we, there's an auto body shop here, I promise. But, but, but one hour a week isn't it. And as you and I navigate this thing, here's what Scripture teaches us, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. As you and I look at church, uh, there are plenty of people in our world today that are saying, you know, I don't, I don't need to go to church. I, I read my Bible and, and just me and the Lord. It's proof that you don't read your Bible if you think you don't need church. Because Scripture tells us to not forsake gathering together, to get in community. Why? Because godly wisdom comes from being connected to God's people. So husbands, my challenge for you in this is that you should be the one spearheading church as a priority for your family. I know that there may be times where, where your wife has to drag you to church, but if you want to ever step into being the spiritual leader of your home, it's got to become your priority that you drive, that you filter and funnel things through. Because if church is an optional thing for you, it will be an optional thing for the rest of your family. The unfortunate part about leadership is you are either a great leader or a poor one. There is rarely an in-between. But wives, I also know that there are some of you here today and your husband isn't here. And you're sitting there thinking to yourself, like, I, I, I am praying and I'm believing and I, I wish my husband could hear this mess. You can send them the link. Don't do it passive aggressively. It won't work out for you, right? But like, I know that there are some of you that are praying and, and here's what I want to challenge you and encourage you with. Don't stop praying. Even in in this experience as well, I can look out and I see some faces of some men that are sitting here that for years their wives were in here by themselves, praying, waiting, believing. And we serve a God who is not done pursuing those that are lost. So if you're here and you feel like, man, I just wish my husband was here, you keep praying, you keep believing. But regardless of whether your spouse is all in or not, you are called as a believer to have your foundation built on the rock, not on the sand. A marriage is only going to work if two people build their house on the rock. That's a firm foundation. So for some of us here this morning, like the, the, the priority is that we would choose to get ourselves in order first. I'm sure if you thought about it right now, you could tell me 10 things your spouse needs to change. But chances are pretty high that your relationship with God might be off too. And so the first relationship we get right is our relationship with the Lord. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed in the room today, here's what I know. Is that there are some of you in the room who... You don't currently have a relationship with Jesus or maybe you've strayed or you've, you've wandered. But you know that it's time for you to get right with God. And if you're here and you'd say, hey, Pastor, I want to make that decision to let God be the one who's in control of my life. Would you just lift your hand for a moment and say, that's me. Here's what we're going to do, church. Nobody prays alone. We all pray together. Will you say this to me? Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I place my hope and trust in you. Thank you for dying in my place. 
so that I could have new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, will you stand to your feet and help me celebrate with those who made decisions this morning? Yeah. I'm going to have my wife, Tori, join me on stage for a second because we're going to pray over marriages. We're going to continue to sing out a song today. As we do that, our prayer team is going to be available on the side walls if you need prayer for anything. We believe that, that today, as you and I kind of reset and get the foundation right, we can build it on God's word, his ways, and his wisdom. And as we do that, we can build it on the rock. It's not that you're never going to go through storms. You go through storms all the time. There, I, I, you know, we'll be honest with you. Like, this has been a tough season for us. But our marriage, I'd say, I mean, you could disagree, but I'd say it's stronger <laughs> than ever. Because the worst time to figure out you've got foundation problems is when you're in a storm. Because there's things you wish you would have done beforehand. So today's an opportunity for you to get right with the Lord, to surrender it all, to lay it down. And so if you're here with your spouse today, would you grab their hand really quick? We're going to pray. And listen, for some of you, I know this is this can be painful because you your spouse isn't here and you're believing in faith. And so I just want you to invite the Lord for just a moment to heal those things and believe God for even greater. Let me pray for you today. Father, we thank you that marriage was your idea, not ours. And we believe that you're bigger and greater than every attack that the enemy would try and throw our way. We, we, don't, see, we don't see an attack of the enemy until marriage comes into play in Scripture. And so we know that his goal is to get in, to destroy, and to divide. But we believe that you are even greater than any scheme or attack that the enemy has to throw. For every person in here that has a husband they're praying and believing for, every woman that is sitting there right now going, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. Would you just give them hope today? Would you strengthen them from the inside out to know that you love their spouse more than they do? For every husband who's on the fence about going all in or wants to be a godly husband but doesn't know what to surrender, Lord, would you give them the courage to say, God, whatever you want from me, I'll do it. God, for every marriage that's in turmoil, would you solidify their foundation that they might be able to waver through every storm knowing you are bigger than anything they face. Father, for every marriage that feels like they're good right now, would you just show them that, hey, in you, anything can get better. Would you give us the strength and the hope we need to know that no matter what storm we face, we can say it is well with our marriage because we've put all of our hope and all of our trust in you. We thank you in advance for the work that you've done today, Lord, knowing that it'll reap a harvest that surpasses anything we could imagine. We love you. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us at Propel Church today. My name is Pastor Nick Newman, and on behalf of myself and our whole team here, we are so grateful that you chose to engage with our worship experience today and hear God's word. We would love to help you take a next step, but the only way we can do that is if you engage with us. So do us a favor, go to propel.church. If you feel led to uh, take a next step today, our website will walk you through that. And if you feel led to give, you can click the giving tab to partner with us financially to continue to impact Mount Pleasant and the surrounding areas for Jesus.